Hi, Ming Ho. Thank you for coming on to the show. Thank you. Good morning. I understand Iron Man is somewhat of your role model. Let's bring yeah. us back to the moment where you first got exposed to Iron Man. Was it during the movie, during the comic book? What, what was the sentiment that you were going through back then? Well, it actually started off from the movie. So we've got, and all those who have followed the Marvel Avengers series, there was Iron Man 1, 2, 3, and then the different series that at the end of the day ended up with the final series where Iron Man and the team tried to save the world. And that was kind of stuck in my mind for a while when I got onto Iron Man. Mr. Tony, the Mr. Wonderful, Mr. Arrogant, Mr. Stubborn, Mr. Technology, who's kind of, you know, at the end of the day came out as a hero in all the series, kind of latched onto me for a while. So when the organization was on the way out back in 2019, when the person announcement shared with me with regards to the shareholder wanting to pull out from this particular investment, it kind of triggered me and well, this is interesting. I kind of popped out. I wouldn't say blue, but kind of, you know, showed up quite vividly and I named the project. Project I'm in. Now there are I'm in and I'm in in the background, but that probably is for a different discussion. It was also when the announcement was shared, when I mean, the shareholders, the previous shareholder kind of shared with me and I finally figured out that they wanted to exit. As much as you may find out later on that I can be loud mouth, stubborn, you know, commanding, etc., and all that kind of feature, I realized that I didn't have a bit more crude in terms of the word that I'm going to use, right? I don't have the, the guts to actually go tell 600 people that they don't have a job anymore in the coming near future. So that kind of started the entire project I am in. And that's where the discussion, the, the actions that need to be taken throughout that period to exit mm. the organization and to become where we are today. So that's Iron Man, and, and like I said, you know, and the, the following project, the following activities, we have the two and the three, and then we'll see how we land up in the, mm. in the next 12 months. This whole Iron Man project, Iron Man thing came about because the, the company Mingho was with, and still with right now, was supposed to exit entirely. And that would, of course, result in a mass exodus of headcount, which, of course, he came in just like Tony Stark in his Iron Man suit and tried to turn things around. Let's deep dive a bit more into that because in today's world, to hear this kind of story, it's really nice. It feels very different because I guess as we move along, we are becoming more and more capitalistic. You look at maybe, I think it was a year, two years ago, Microsoft record billion dollar revenue. Next week, we are going to fire 200 people. You know, the world has just reached that kind of state where, huh? Common sense cannot even help you to grapple with reality. But let's put that aside first. I'd like to just touch a bit about your industry because oil and gas, okay, I came from recruitment. Last time I also did some recruitment for oil and gas companies. But to really understand a bit more in depth, I honestly would not be able to share much. Could you perhaps take a few minutes of your time to help us understand in a very layman manner, what exactly is the thing mm -hmm. that your company do? Ming Ho, maybe I take half a step back. Just a little bit about the industry. So the oil and gas industry in a very simplistic manner is divided into three sectors. We call it upstream, where one will go out and drill or explore and produce. So when you drill, you basically, in a very layman term, again, you drill a hole and hopefully you strike gold or you strike oil or you strike gas. And subsequently, you produce. That's the upstream side. So that's where we are, and I'll explain a bit more in, in a minute. Then you've got the midstream. So after you find the oil or the hydrocarbon, you then have to transport it. So either from offshore, from the middle of the desert, or out in the mountains or, or somewhere out in the jungle, you will have to transport it to the third stage, which is the downstream. So that transportation stage where you see or you hear, you may hear, long pipe, piping, line pipe, exact terminologies as such, that means we have to transport it from A to B. Mm. Sounds easy, but there's bits and pieces of technology. Then there is the final part, which is the downstream. That's where you hear or you see refineries. That's where they process the hydrocarbon into final product. That will be in, Sing in Singapore's term, Wuljurong Island, where you hear Shell, you hear Exxon, etc. BP, where they actually process 
the raw material, which is the hydrocarbon, the oil and the gas into a final product. Can be petrol, can be diesel, can be certain plastic equipment and all that. So where we are in OMS, we're in the upstream. So we service the operators and the services company in the upstream side where we do the drilling bit. Sorry, let's start with the exploration bit where they go out and then they look for oil or for gas and then they start to drill and then of course they start to produce. So we provide services in terms of designing and manufacturing such equipment for them to use in their application when they go out and look for oil and gas. So they are basically pressure containing or pressure controlling equipment. Because when you drill, as you need the oil to kind of come up from the ground, then there's pressure to actually push it up. Right? Very limited. There's, there's a lot of kind of engineering st stuff inside there. Then in order to do that, then there's the need to control and there's the need to contain. Because if you can't control and you can't contain, then you get this terminology, which we sometimes hear or see on the TV, a blowout. Basically, an explosion, accident happens very vividly in a lot of us would be 2010, 2011, when the Gulf of Mexico, Mocondo, Deepwater Discovery, it's just some names that I about, happen. Then, you know, fatality, investigations, et cetera, et cetera, will then kind of uh, come in. So that's our space. Services, design and the manufacturing of equipment for upstream drilling, exploration and production purposes. Hopefully I did not over technical it. That is a kind of a fairly technical field, but yeah, this is where we're at. Let's go back to where we first started about Project Iron Man and you stepping in to salvage this organization as well as all the associated headcount with it. I must imagine it did not. Sure. Well, it might have come naturally as a reaction, but I'm very certain it is a heavy decision to make. Could you just bring us back to the days prior when you were still pondering, should I, should I not? What were going through your head back then? Well, it was, I was basically freaking out quietly. I've been with the organization by then 2019. So I came across from, from, from previous organization back in 2012, late 2012, early 2013. So it's been a good five, six years going into the seventh year. And of course, the, the shareholder gave me the opportunity to run the business or so take over as CEO from 2014. And of course, from 2014 onwards, the industry crashed and burned. We were all just trying to survive, trying to keep our heads above water, etc. And hence, then come this, this announcement. Right after that, I still remember, you know, the day, the date, or the month at least, where it happened. And right after that, the day or two, you know, I was kind of like, well, yeah, I was kind of freaking out and I'm like, well, what am I going to do? What is the intent? The intent actually is while we, while I shared that we're going to leave or the shareholders are going to exit, it was actually to liquidate. So basically you're going to close up the company and all the, all the countries that we've got back up now that, and I shared about the 600 people. So I call up two or three of my closer friends and I say, Oh, you know, I'm running into this interesting challenge here. They're going to close down the company. You know, what in the world am I going to do now? Call it at a loss. Some said, look, you got to rally up your first team and share it with them. Be open. Some basically couldn't help much at that point in time because it was also a shock. And I kind of, as I drive, and I like to, when I drive to work, it takes about 40, 45 minutes. And you understand the Singapore traffic. If there's an accident on the other side of the road, then everything kind of pile up from this side of the road. And I normally drive without the radio on. So there's a bit of more pondering and call it distraction, dangerous as well. Um, and I came to a conclusion as I parked the car down in the office and I thought, well, what if I take over management buyout in another term? Absolutely no idea about management buyout, Adrian. I read about it. You know, you read about it, you see it on TV and all that wonderful stuff, all the wonderful stories and everything else, but the, the actual mechanics, the detail behind it, I mean, it's totally alien to me. And I said, let's have a punt at this. And we had one of the meeting and I said, what if I take over? And they looked at me, kind of looked at me and said, hmm, all right, let us go back and consider. 
No idea, right? About how this is going to be done. Two weeks later, they came back and they say, how son? They call me how son. It looks good because one, there is a potential of keeping the jobs. Of course, that's my primary objective. Two, it makes the exit strategy for them probably manageable because between having someone to take over and to liquidate it, call it close shop. It's a lot more difficult and different. Like we got 10, 11 facilities at that point in time. And they're not like in Singapore or Kuala Lumpur or big cities. They are in smaller towns, remote towns. Example in Sumatra, some couldn't, I mean, you know, it, it took some of my guys a while to figure out, well, where's Sumatra and where's Juri and where's Pakambaru and all that, right? And then you have Thailand. Everybody knows Bangkok, but nobody knows this place called Satahip. Nobody knows this place well. In inverted comma, nobody knows, right? Where Songkla is. Everybody know where Hat Jai is mm. for Singaporean, right? That's 45 minutes away from Hat Jai, Songkla. So it's not that easy to actually go through that process of liquidation. Hence, we all felt, they felt that it's a good, it's a good approach. And we went down that road. And this is where I start to learn because they'll be asking very financial question, even though I'm kind of dabbing my, my hands in finance as a CEO. Well, what's the valuation? How much do you think you want to buy if it's wrong? How do we go about doing it? And the next question will be, where in the world am I going to get the fund wrong? It's not like I, I own, you know, thousands of acres of rubber plantations or whatnot somewhere else. Or I found an oil well somewhere that I'm actually producing oil at the back of my HDB flat. So, and that was kind of a very interesting journey, a very interesting learning process as well. So whomever that wished to embark on what we call a management buyout. There are many versions and there are many ways of doing it. You just got to be ready and to also expect the unexpected. I was very fortunate that between both parties, because of the intent to do this in a very friendly and amicable manner, there was no, how would I put it, bang the tables, walk out, and then, you know, nobody wants to talk to each other for two weeks, and then somebody drags you back into the meeting room to discuss that. Everything was smooth flowing. They were very supportive in terms of preparing the documentation. They were even very supportive in coming up with solutions. Because when they acquired the organization, there was a lot of legal, but very creative financial call accounting done. But they're all legal, right? It's just a very complex way of managing the balance sheet and it, it takes half a rocket scientist to actually try to figure out and understand how it's done. <laughs> and because I was the CEO and we were part of that organization, that element wasn't really focused on, right? Because you just run your business because there's this big conglomerate behind you. But once you're out, you need to understand, well, why did it happen? How exactly did it happen? Why is this number in this bucket, etc. cetera. Right, I'm going to a bit more technical bit. So, so it was very helpful, but. At the very beginning, Adrian, it was freaking out. I was like, well, how am I going to do it? And then when we said we have a deal, it was also in a freaking out position. So how am I going to finish this deal? And COVID came in the midst of all this. Uh, 2019 was kind of the first discussion. 2020, COVID came. Everything was shut down. We were still discussing. And it was only until January 2023, so 2019 to 2023, that the we call it the share purchase agreement, the SPA, was signed. So it took that long to go through the negotiations and partly because of COVID. And it did not, my first team, N-1 in HR terminology, was not aware of this particular project other than a handful of finance staff. They didn't know about the exit plan of Project IMN until August 2022. It was only in March 2023 a couple of months after I signed the SBA, that the N minus two were kind of made aware of when we had what I normally organize on an annual basis, the leadership meeting up in KL. So then they found out and only in June, 2023, which is about a year ago, where we finally completed all the necessary transaction or the necessary requirement to then become independent. So throughout that period, Adrian, there was also a lot of, uh, other than freaking out, there was also a lot of uncertainty because when we're going through this discussion, there will be elements that you agree or you disagree as a time factor. And as you keep moving to the right with the discussion, then there's always that 
feeling of uncertainty. Well, are we going to get across the line or are we just going to keep spinning? And then after a period of time, and it has been years, where the deal is off. Now, when the deal is off, it means I go back to the original plan of liquidation mm. and you kind of wasted mm. or spent a lot of energy and effort during that three plus years. So there's also that element of uncertainty. And because of my nature of wanting to manage the information, manage so-called the uncertainty, it was only me plus a handful of finance people because we need to run the math mm. that, that, that are aware of it. Then the rest of the team will be wondering, well, what's he up to? Why is he, you know, kind of having all these secret mission meetings, right? Where you had the shareholders who rocks in and then an hour later they rock out and then that's it, right? There was no, no update, no, no chit chatting, no gossiping going on, what's going on kind of deal. It was personally from, you know, call it after the fact, it, it's, it was, it was interesting. It was kind of heavy on my mind, in my mind, on myself, but that, you know, am I going to pull this through or am I going to kind of at the end of the day, you know, mm. ended up with the original plan. What helped? Adrian was the team, as much as there were uncertainty hmm. and COVID didn't help, but the, the industry downturn did not help, the team kept going. So very simple instruction, right? Boss, what is going on? Don't worry about it. Service the customer, do the right thing, get the right quality product, keep everybody safe, safety, hmm. and we just keep going, right? If, if we've got a number to chase, we, we chase that number and you guys just keep going. And they kept going, they just keep going. And that resulted in a lot of, well, that resulted in, in I wouldn't say taken a lot of pressure off, but, but that helped because they are then focusing on day-to-day -day operations, uh, working on the new product, qualification testings, et cetera, and all that, getting beat up by the customers as usual. And then we just keep going from that angle. And we're, I was able to, for lack of a better word, you know, filter that uncertainty out for a while. So the team kept going. What helped also was from 2020, 2021, actually the market was picking up. It was a recovery period. COVID didn't really affect it a lot. COVID, the disruption from COVID or the pandemic was the mobility of personnel moving around because you got to quarantine, you got to do your test. That was more of a uh, destruction, but activities are there. It just no, you, you got to do, and I've done it, right? Now you're going to do your swab test. You got to be isolated. You got to be quarantined. I sidetracked for two minutes. I remember when they opened up the VTL, call it, where you're able to travel with certain restriction. It took me 12, almost 14, 15 hours to travel from Singapore to Johor Bahru because I had to fly all the way to KL and fly all the way down to Suba, to Sinai in Johor and then take the car. At the end of the day, it took me 14, 15 hours to go to Johor, to end up with the facility in Johor. So the market was picking up. There was also that funny time period as well, because the market was picking up, results were getting good. The results were getting better. And then there was a bit of a college uncertainty. Number two, are you guys going to finish going through this deal or are you all going to reverse and not do the deal? That means they're going to keep the organization. I, and there was a lot of concern, look, you know, the books are good, the, the results are good. We're kind of very popular word with me and, and my team, you know, sandbagging the numbers. Instead of doing two, we reported one, everything's legal, everything's legal, right? So, but they did come back and they said, look, our son, we have already made that decision. We're going down this road and there's no U-turn. So I said, cool. And that's finished it. Of course, it took until January slash June to, to be able to finish it. So that was those, those period. The team kept going. Uh, the former shareholder was supportive. And I learned a lot of stuff, right? With regards to technically, with regards to the process itself, mm. how to fake it when the world is kind of upside down, how to stay calm, right? I, I think that's that. That should be the right way, right? How, how to kind of stay calm and be myself and myself mm. will be the philosophy of what you see is what you get. Like if it's a bad day, it's a bad day, it's a good day, it's a day. So, so there's no, in more local term, there's no wayang behind it. Hence, we, we are where we are today. A bit of a long-winded 
Merry go round. No problem at all. That's the purpose of a long form podcast, so we can really deep dive into it. There's a million questions that I want to ask you, but I think first of all, I'm keen to understand due to the longevity of this discussion from day one until the deal was cemented. I'm very certain there might be at some point Mm -hmm. you're also so jaded and would be thinking, ah, I cannot move this on anymore. There's so much pressure going on you and the fact that you still have to put up the front in front of most of your employees. You did mention earlier on your continuous support from your employees at large were one of the key motivations for the kept going. I'm just wondering, are there any other form of support that you seek or maybe would just happen to come along for you that really help put you in a better shape, form and health perhaps to continue this battle forward? Well, once the decision to do this takeover or, or the buyout, then the the closer friends that I have outside of the organization, they then mm-hmm. understood and they tr- they will rally around and say, look, why don't we look at this? Why don't we talk to such and such, and such an individual? They may be able to help, maybe from a financial point of view, maybe from a future discussion point of view and all that. So mm-hmm. so that kind of allow me to say, right, okay, because once you we, we cross the finishing line, it's, it's not just we cross the finishing line. Because we are going to keep running with that that race, right? That, it's another race. It's not even a marathon. Oh. Yeah, it's another race, right? It's, it's, it's a never-ending marathon. Crossing the line is one thing. You kind of enjoy it for a couple of minutes. And then you kind of move on again, right? What's next? And how, how are you going to do it? So during that period itself, actually, Ironman 2 and Ironman 3 was in this conception. So that kind of allowed me to, right? We haven't even finished the first movies, but... Again, this is all about vision, visions moving forward, what's next, that allows you to, to have that, that aim or target, right? Once, once we finish round one, we're going to do round two, IMN two, and then the, the, it will lead to IMN three. So that then opens up that pathway, that light at the end of the tunnel. That, because if, if there's only IMN one and we finish the race, then what's next and there's no plan, in call it three years, I'm guessing right now, we may not exist anymore as well. There has to be a longer path and we're going to keep going from there, right? Because the, the industry itself is volatile. The industry itself is also going to change. You'll hear all the wonderful thing about COP26, COP27, COP28, the renewables, the clean energies and all that, that whole lot of coming in. So with that, other than a team, like you said, we kept on going the so-called outside support slash opportunity, the fact that, and you have to give credit, where credit is due that the market was kind of creeping back up again, that helps as well. Because ultimately when we crossed the finishing line, Mm -hmm. we were more financially stable with regards to the results. So hence we put from that. So if you allowed me to add on, then when we exited because of the complex financial structure, there is, and there was, I use the word was, a leftover loan that we have to then, as an independent company, to still pay back to the shareholders. So there was a loan, and it is a sizable amount of loan. But because of the exit and everything else, you know, we took it, I took it, uh, because we wanted to exit, and then we moved on. Now that loan was given, of course, back then, interest rate has already gone up, way up, have to take it. I had the option of what they call a two plus one year option. So you start your first year with interest. And then when you go into your second year, with the interest and the capital. And if we need to extend, then we do the plus one to try and pay off this amount. It was a burden as well, because on one hand, and this is no disrespect to the previous share, on one hand, we are out. On one hand, we still owe something. So you, you, you kind of still see them is they, they want to know, well, what's going to happen to my loan? Are you going to pay my loan? Can you share with me your financial status so far? That, that kind of situation. Mm. And because the team kept going, because the industry picked up and we were able to diversify the, some of our newer products into some of the countries, I'm happy that we actually paid off the entire amount last, well, this April, not too long ago. So, so that is a burden off us as well from mm. a financial perspective. And so today 
we're kind of debt free. So there's no debt. We had a good year, right? Because I will reward the team when needed. So we kind of went down that road. And hence, this is where we are today. So I'm very pleased the team hung around despite getting beat up every other day. Nobody left, as in when I shared the first time round with regards to Iron Man 1, I said, look, team, boys, girls, we're going to exit. Nobody left, as in I shared with them, I said, nobody's going to fault anybody if you feel uncomfortable or if you feel insecure and you want to find a better path. I said, look, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to beat you up when I see you at Orchard Road kind of deal. So everybody stayed. When we cross the finishing line, we have the natural attrition. Some of the younger yeah. ones find a better job somewhere. That's fine. That's part of our sort of life anyway, of a working environment. But the key team hung around. So they understood the challenges. They wanted to carry on with the challenges. Part two of the marathon and then part three, part four. Of course, I meant two and three are kind of secretive or being managed right now. Not everybody knows about that, the two and the three. But it all helps. And hence, I'm um, as much as the pressure, as much as sometimes I whine and I say, well, whine and complain like a baby, but I am very appreciative of the team. Mm. I think it is a good indication of the initial reaction to this whole news being broken to you by the original shareholder that we're going to dissolve, we're going to close down the whole thing and for you to Think about taking over and, of course, on the premise that you want to save all those jobs. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, it is quite a, a very different thing that we do see in papers, in news everywhere. Because, as I mentioned earlier on, even companies that make money also retrench people. I want to understand where did this approach come from? Is it something that you learned along the way? Was it a childhood lesson that you acquired that you actually put people first? Because I must imagine, yeah. especially during that period of time, oil prices were low. Uh, now, I'm not sure if my correlation is correct, but I'm very certain it may have affected your kind of industry. So as much as you want to prioritize people, you still have to pay the bills. So again, going right. back to my original question, where did this whole approach or this whole principle come from? It started way back when I first started a lot of work, right? So I came into the workforce. I'm actually a graduate in construction or building, and I joined a mechanical slash manufacturing outfit in oil and gas. So it was 180 degrees, but I was there. And the first organization I joined was American oil field manufacturing company by the name of Vetco Gray. They no longer exist because they were acquired by General Electric further down the road. And I was two years into my working life, young little punk, right? Trying to build a career aimlessly. So I was given the opportunity to manage the warehouse logistics department. This is like back in the early 90s. So you can calculate how old I am now. In the early 90s, I had the opportunity to supervise that particular department. Oil industry was coming down. It was like a five-year cycle. Right? Four or five years mm. was a good time and then one year were down, that kind of thing. And it was in a downturn. And I was told, you got to retrench your team. 15 people, I remember that was the number. Uh, two years into the workforce, no, I, I don't even understand what does the word retrench mean. Like, oh, what? Look, look, we don't need them anymore. We got to let go of them. Oh, and I had to walk 15 of them down the yard, call it, to the HR department. And that's it. They lost their job. And I was like, wow, I mean, this is how the work life is all about. And this is not very nice. And, and I kind of hated it from that point in time, especially when one is kind of young and then you are doing it to individuals who are older than you, individuals who could be not that well off from you, et cetera, and all that. So it kind of stuck in me that this is not something that I like. And throughout those years, there were... Again, one or two smaller retrenchment exercise, not in such big numbers, but I hated it. I hated it. And then it got worse when the organization was acquired by a bigger organization. And hence, two words popped up in me. One, social units, economic units. This is where I kind of figure out and say that in many instances, 
big organizations, especially, and, and there's no kind of anger or whatnot, right? It's just the nature of the world, nature of the business back then, that organization treats people at the very beginning as economic units. So you're just a number. So when business is up, we hire. When business is down, the number doesn't match up, we release them. So you're just an economic unit. Without understanding, look, at the end of the day, everybody's a human being. The social unit has to feature from the very first retrenchment experience to later on when the definition of economic units really kind of flared up and we were told that, look, you got to lay off X number of people, 15 from this department and 10 from this department, right? Even if I can find 13 and 12, even though the total is the same, no, it has to be 15 and 10. You cannot do your math and do it that way. Oh, you got to do it now. You got to do it within short period of time. So there's no feelings or sentiment with regards to, look, they're, they're all social units, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what runs a company? The people. I can, or the team can win a lot of orders, build up your order books, your backlog. At the end of the day, who executes it? Yeah, we talk about automation, we talk about artificial intelligence, etc. That's just lately. But it is the people who actually is going to do the work and deliver the product or the services out to the customer. So I kind of always want to balance this too. And I will always, humanly possible, the social unit definition has a higher ranking than an economic unit. So if we can hold on and hold as long as I can without going down that economic unit road, and I'll hold on. When I took over in 2014, Downton came six months after I took over, right? Everything just kind of went downhill. Everybody from the big boys, the mid boys, and the smaller boys were letting go people. That's the nature of the beast, right? The oil and gas industry, when it's happy, everybody higher. When it's not happy, everybody let go. It took me about more than a year, more than a year after the downturn started, where everybody was kind of packing up, retrenching, that I finally did a small exercise. And even that, that was painful to, to do. If I recall the, the number, it was like 10 individuals. Like 10 out of at that point in time, we'll probably add 400 people and whatnot. It's a small number if it is an economic formula, but 10 is 10. 10, 10 people is 10 people. So, so that has always kind of featured with me, or call it my style, my, my approach. Now, of course, the treating them or treating everybody or making everybody as a social unit has its fallback. When times are bad, we'll hold back and you may not get what we call a bonus or an expulsion payout or a salary increment and whatnot, but we'll, we'll hold and keep your job as long as possible. And if the market is good, I will give back, right? How much depends on situation, depends on timing and whatnot. But if the market is bad or times are bad, please work with me and be patient. And then we can continue that journey. Hence, this is the whole philosophy behind it. Social unit, economic unit. I hear you, Microsoft hired or X company hired so many and then one year later, they kind of let go. Over hiring maybe, right? Times are good and then they hire. And then times are bad, they just kind of let go. It's also linking to, it's not just about shareholders. I mean, it's about, and I'm learning this as well. It's about stakeholders. You run a sustainable organization. You have to do this. Stakeholders are made up of shareholders. Yes, you have shareholders, big, small and whatnot. Stakeholders are also your employees. Stakeholders are your customers. Hmm. your supplier, and what's the fifth one? Your, call it regulators, your government. These are all the stakeholders that plays in this, in this complex formula of sustainability. And, and that's, I learn, or I'm learning, I'm, I'm not learning yet, right? How to balance and move this five, you know, throw this five up in the end, which one's going to come down first, which I'm going to throw it back up. So that at the end of the day, it is, I hope, a sustainable way forward to be sustainable. And it's not just about shareholders and profit. Profit is important, yes. If there's no profit, then nobody's going to be around. It's how much profit. And when we talk about profit, we also want to consider cash flow. I'm going to finance right now. Profit is a number on an Excel spreadsheet. Cash flow is cash flow. Cash is cash. Cash is king. That's my philosophy. Cash is king. 
right? It's profit doesn't mean cash. Cash doesn't mean profit, but it would be nice to have profit and cash together. If you have cash, then you're able to sustain, move forward, invest, pay a little bit higher, maybe pay some bonuses, that kind of a situation. So there's that as well that needs to come into play. It's a learning journey, Adrian. It's about if you follow Jack Welch, the late Jack Welch, he said this, he said, one can play the short game, one can play the long game, right? But it's not easy to play the long and the short together. I can play mm -hmm. the short game. That means it's all about profit, it's all about number, and then I just move on. Some will want to play the long game. Well, it's about the vision, about the strategy. Yes, right? You're kind of a, a, a bit of a dream moving forward. But it has to be both. And it's not easy to play both. So as, as we move forward, then how do we balance this to moving forward, right? So a bit of, a bit of finance, a bit of, a bit of Jack Welsh. That's how I want to learn mm. and I want to, to operate. Now, am I the perfect guy? I'm learning every day, hopefully, and, and I want to, not just for myself, but also for the organization and the people that will get to a point where we're mm. all going to be that, that long journey, that Tour de France, going up the hill, mm. coming down the hill, cycling event. Your hundreds of employees that stay throughout might have to pay a sense of gratitude to the first 15 employees you have to retrench and that exercise give you that awakening moment. And I think that those are the things that we go through in life that we learn along the way, right? And sometimes these are situations thrown to us. And of course, you could learn from the success of the bigger leaders out there, as you mentioned, the late Jack Welsh. I also want to touch on, because when I look at many profiles of leaders, CEOs, I tend to see things from a very, how should I put it? It's too polished. You know, a lot of profile of CEO is like, oh, I do this, very good. But I believe in reality, not just leaders, everyone, we also go through our lowest point. We also make some certain mistakes, which of course we will try to learn from, try to absorb and try to make sure this doesn't happen again. Throughout your long career, what is probably your biggest mistake of failure? And of course, what did you learn from it that made you a better leader? There are so-called business role models that are out in Fortune 500, you know, Wall Street journals, etc. and all that. There are books, everything else is written. I dabble in them. I think I shared some bits and pieces kind of deal. Ultimately, they all kind of link back to this thing called humility. There is that need to be humble. You can be successful and not humble. Just because one is successful doesn't mean that you're God or you're king and whatnot. That piece seems to be missing. So when you say being Polish and all that, yes, that's maybe because it is the need by the world in the larger world to not be able to hear bad news, for example. Everything has to be good. Everything has to be mm. hunky-dory. Therefore, you've got to be able to do that. But behind the scene, I'm sure it'll be nice to hear the stories. The day when you're about to break down and whatnot, right? Of course, then people will say, oh, yeah, this particular leader is no good because he is weak. No, not necessary. What you see is what you get, right? Then you are more truthful, for lack of a better word. Then people hopefully will then recognize and accept and being able to, to support you. So what is some of those lessons that I kind of crash and burn? Now, being the younger, in the younger days, again, one of those where I have made it, you know, I'm, I'm moving up the ladder kind of deal. A little bit of that arrogance will tend to creep in. If not, will be kind of there. And that's probably, again, the humility part, right? Because the arrogant part will lead you to a path of you think you are invincible, like the Iron Man thing, right? Ultimately, the joke has always been, look, Iron Man's great. I love the motto. I love Tony Stark, whatever. But the last series, Iron Man died. So be careful, right? Be careful about that bit. So one of the lessons is as you move up the ladder, the arrogance bit do creep in. And that's where you will lose it. You will lose it in terms of either an opportunity to grow or you lose it in terms of your relationship with your peers or your subordinate. So the biggest lesson, and this is when the first company that I was with, called Bad Cool Grey, love the name, love the company. I was on and all together for 21 and a half years. Five of which, or the last five during that period, 
we were acquired by a huge mega MNC. And uh, here comes the MNC sometimes. They'll come and, and they will say, look, you know, your processes is no good. Ours is better. You need to do this. You need to do that. Mm. Rightly or wrongly, that's life, right? The big boys come in and you kind of follow. And the arrogance, a little bit of the arrogance in me, here you are, one man trying to fight against this multinational mega organization that at that point in time has 300,000 people. Well, as much as the story of David beat Goliath, this David cannot handle Goliath, right? This is like Goliath times 200 kind of situation. It, it, it brought me down. It literally brought me down. And I realized, look, and, and we hear about it. I, I hear about it back then. Pick your battle, you know, choose your battle, be, be collaborative as if I or something. That, that didn't kind of feature at that point in time during those, those years. It was just Mickey Mouse David trying to fight with Super Goliath. Mm -hmm. And it brought me down to a point that, right, okay, this is not the way how it should work as much as small organization has its, call it office politics, big organization has their own politics. And I mean, this is just a fact of life. This is how we manage it as we grow through our career. And that, like I said, was call it a reality check. So humility is key. Of course, you need to be honest. Right. If you don't like it, you don't like it, right? Now, of course, for me, if I don't like it, I'll say it outright. Or once you see my papaya face, you know that, right? He doesn't like it. And and then kind of work with it, right? So from call it the Jack Wells, long-term, short-term, from promoter books, how to be a leader, how to be a CEO, how to do this and, and how to that. It, it's all about, and like I said, Adrian, it, it is a long-term journey, long-term learning process about humility and being yourself. If you can get this formula right, then there is hope in inverted comma that we are able to keep going. If you get this formula wrong, then okay, the journey may not be as smooth as it needs to be. I hope that kind of share a little bit about. I would think that the presence of self-awareness has to come in first. Because if there's no self-awareness, your sense of arrogance will still continue. You, you will still think that you're right. And I believe yeah. it's the level of self-awareness help you to understand I don't have all the answers. I need to learn more, which lead me to my next question, which I can perhaps more or less imagine what you're going to say already, because I do understand you read mm -hmm. quite a number of books. You read quite a lot. And I'm very certain some of them may have influenced you, the way you operate, the way you lead your life, as well as your leadership style. That's quite a long list. For the benefit of our audience, if there's only one book, that I need you to recommend that has the most impact yeah. on your leadership style, which one would it be? There's a long list. And actually, if you go to the house, there's a whole cupboard of books that are probably still in plastic bag that I haven't opened yet. Yeah. So hopefully the day when I kind of slow down, I can finish reading all those books. Like at the end of the day, if, if I kind of look, peel the onion and look beyond it, it's about teaching you to be humble. There's this particular simple book from Marshall Goldsmith. And I kind of have it in front of me so that I don't misquote him. It's what got you here won't get you there. So it's about, right, look, I've reached the stage of being a manager, example. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it doesn't mean that the way and the manner and, and the opportunity that got you there is going to get you to the next stage. So it's a pretty simple book to read. And it says, look, what you hear ain't going to get you there. And then one needs to realize self-awareness, like you said. Mm -hmm. Like, where is that self-awareness? And in that, there's a chapter that talks about one of the 20 habits that's going to roadblock you from realizing how to move forward. And there are a couple of them out of the 20. I kind of have the book in front of me, right? One is wanting to win too much. So the need to win at all costs, the need to win any argument at all costs, the need to write, you know, everything has to be one kind of deal will detract you from your next step. And the second one is adding too much value. And this is very typical of us, right? Because we have been there. No, I have eaten more salt than you. That kind of terminology. And therefore, you know, the way that you're doing it is not right because I've done it in the last 30 years. I've done it with this company. This company was big. Mm -hmm. This is just adding way too much value that you will then potentially stifle, call it the creativity or, or the improvement suggestion from, from the other side. 
And, and this is a learning curve, right? I, I do that sometimes as well. No, 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 it cannot be done. It has to be done this way, right? Maybe keeping quiet for, for the entire conversation, for the entire meeting or discussion, it's, it's a lot more helpful than just to keep adding value, right? This is an interesting one, Adrian, right? It says, always starting with a no, a but, or a however. In any conversation, we always say, no, I don't think it's such and such a case, you know, or you go into somebody gave an idea, but I've seen this before, you know, it's not going to work. Or the other guy say, however, <laughs> I hear you, Adrian, however, right? That, it, it, I do that a lot. And sometimes I have to stop myself I say, I, and I'll go into a conversation. I think I've said too many, but okay, let, me, let, let me take a step back. Failing to give proper recognition. Not everything is you, right? Not everything is me. The boys and the girls and everything else did that. So it's about personal reward, personal mm. recognition. A thank you. A well done, right? And sometimes, even for me, it's so difficult to say thank you. It's so difficult to say well done. Chill out a bit, right? Loosen up a bit. Uh, then you have a few more kind of read the back, making excuses. Cling on to the past. This is interesting. As I grow through the different career, different organization, as I move up the ladder or move parallel mm. on the ladder, right? We have the tendency to refer back to the past. And in the past, I did this. Therefore, no, this is the way it should be done. Or clinging on to the past could be, I carry on that baggage with me as I move from one career position to another. That means you don't want to let go. You're carrying it because I've done it before. Therefore, I'm better. Therefore, if I'm running this department right now, or I'm talking mm. about this project right now, I'm going to bring all my past with me. Sometimes it's about, how would I put it? Letting go. I struggle with that as well, letting go. Mm-hmm. Like you're now in a slightly different role, whatever. Now I'm I'm not saying that let go means totally no accountability, no ownership, but allow the team to kind of work around it and and then have that opportunity to have different ways of us uh, fixing a problem, for example, rather than me coming in and always adding too much value and then kind of make it to a point where at the end of the day, well, you know, let the boss decide. Kind of typical, mm-hmm. right? Let the boss decide. Then you kind of, then you get angry, then you get frustrated, then you get all kinds of stuff. And then you really, really sit back and say, well, you created the problem. You created the problem because you didn't allow them to even try. Mm. So, so there's that bit. So, so the books, this book, what got you here won't get you there. It's an interesting read. And from there as well, from Marshall, there's this part where they said, ask six questions. They said, there's this six question that one should ask either on a daily basis or on a regular basis with the team and, and myself or yourself, right? I kind of wrote it down here, right? He says, ask, where are we going? Meaning as a company, as an organization, directionally, well, where are we going? How did the team feel with regards to the direction of the company? So where are we going? Where are you as an employee going? So is your path Align with what the organization's path thought about. Then you have that discussion, that interesting discussion, right? The company wants to be a product and services organization. We mm. want to be more customer focused. We want to be a reliable partner, right? Da, 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 da. And then, but if the individual has a slightly different taste, then you're not in a matching situation. Mm. And they need to have that little discussion to, to understand what's going on. The third question, of course, not, not, not of course, or he, he wanted us to ask is, or well, what is going well? In in my world, or at least with me, we always kind of bring out about the, the, the horror stories, the bad news and, and whatnot. Mm. How about sharing a little bit more? You know, what is going well with the organization? It can't be that this organization is just outright or some organization just outright in a bad shape if we're still here, if we're financially results are doing okay at the end of the year, right? What are your suggestions for your for improvement for the company, for the department? Some organizations are, are, are good in, in asking that. Some are a bit lacking. So what suggestions can you give, right? Mm. Then as so-called the boss, how can I help? I can give a lot of direction. I can even give suggestions that at the end of the day become a command, even though it's just mm. a suggestion. And I said, Boss, boss said must paint the wall yellow. Mm. It was just a suggestion, but then he went ahead and they painted the wall yellow. Why? Because it was deemed, it was seen as a command and then go about doing it. But how can I help? How can I help you, staff, my peer, my direct report, whomever rather, to help you become better 
and also help the organization. So what, how can I help rather than just me giving commands left, right, mm. top center, which I still do. What suggestion do you have for me to improve as an individual? So, hey, boss, can you drink more water? No? Because every time you come in, you're sick or whatever, like kind of things of such. Like, what suggestion do you have for me to improve? Should I have more power hall? Should mm. I have more discussion? Should I have less of such and such a review? Uh, should I walk the shop floor more? Should I visit the facility even more? Mm. Examples of such, right? So the book is about how you, what got you here won't get you there. But somewhere in there, there's also this six question that you can mm. sit down with the team and kind of explore over it, right? Where are we going? Where are you going? What is doing well? What suggestion for the organization? Mm. How can I help? How can I as an individual say improve? That, that's the whole shebang behind this. You got me so interested that I also want to check this book out. But I just want to touch on two I things. One is earlier on, you mentioned about clinging on to the past. It really resonated with me because Brene Brown, she's someone from US, a very famous podcaster as well. She did mention this before and she used a very interesting metaphor, which is your past is like your shiny armor. You had to wear that before because you're going into battle. But once the war is over, right. you still continue to wear the armor. But the weight of the armor will start to wear you down. But you continue to wear it. Whatever you do, go toilet, also wear armor. Uh, go supermarket, also wear armor. But it's pulling you back. Until you realize the day, yeah. this armor does not serve my purpose anymore. You have to drop the armor. Then you are totally reborn, uh, so to speak. I think that clinging on to past is something that I truly, strongly resonated with. And to the sixth question, I actually have one more thing to add to that question, to make it seven. Because I've seen in many corporate environments wow. where many of them practices the part of it. Lah. But I do feel in many corporate environments, something that people tend to overlook is, what is something that I should stop doing or, or start doing lesser? Because maybe it's more of uh, my reference to my previous bosses, which all of them has a tendency to just keep piling on things onto the buffet plate until the mountain uh, start mm. to overflow already without thinking, I need to make space on the plate first before I can put new yeah. things on top. So I would want to put it out there and have people think about it as well. What are things that no longer serve our purpose? It's somewhat like clinging on to the past. This strategy worked 10 years before, but 10 years later now, it doesn't work. Should we still continue? If it doesn't make sense, drop it. Good stuff. Good, I mean, good number seven, Adrian. I'm going to add it on. Okay. And then I'm going to say, right, what am I going to, what do you need me to stop doing, right? And then there'll be silence in the room for about five minutes. Because the next thing will be, what? No, no. But it's, it's interesting. Yes, cling on to the past is key, kind of key. And, and what, should I, what should we stop kind of doing? Okay. In, and as we wind down to this conversation, perhaps something more reflective and lighthearted as well. If you could go back in time and speak with your 30-year-old self, what is the one piece of advice that you mm -hmm. would tell the 30-year-old self? I kind of wrote down the word family. We move in a high-paced world, right? Singapore, Hong Kong, and whatever. We chase career. Doesn't matter whether we are Gen X, baby boomers, or Gen Z, or Alpha. I think right now they're called, right? We chase career. We chase certain material goods, certain position that we want to be comfortable in. One thing that I fail will be the relationship with family members, direct family members, and other family members. I, I, I believe that I have left everybody out to a point where you know, there were, I mean, I would say mistakes made, but there were kind of sad incidences that kind of happened along the way. Regardless of which path one wants to take, ultimately, family comes first. And, and if you miss that, you kind of will regret it. And this is mm. really clinging on to the past for a different reason. I, that, that you'll, you'll miss that opportunity. For me, you know, hard work is important. Yes, you know, you want to have a comfortable life. Yes, you can and, and, and all that. But ultimately, if I go back to the year to my 30 year old self is, you know, that family portion, communicating with your family, building that relationship with family. That's, that's for me. I'm, I'm, I'm very sure there are others who are doing it very well. That's the part where if there's any, I use the word regret, and that's the bit where mm. I would like to patch back. If, if that's the right word. Yeah. Thank you so much for the genuine sharing and thank you, Mingo, for coming onto the show to share with us your experience as a leader going through the tumultuous time 
in facing the prospect of laying off 600 people and closing a business and how, of course, with a very unique approach of leadership to business help salvage all those jobs and to bring it forward and how that actually applied to many other facets of your life. We will add your profile as well as your company website to the bottom of the show notes so that people can have a look. Other than that, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Okay. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you for the opportunity. It was wonderful having this chat. Thank you again. Have a good day.